Hello, my name is Vladimir Kravtsev and work at Canonical as a field engineer. Today we'll be talking about the Kubernetes and specifically Canonical Charm Kubernetes, also known as CK. One of the advantages of CK is that it has multi-cloud support. That means that you could deploy CK everywhere, starting from your on-premise bare metal infrastructure, ending with the whole range of the public clouds. We consider this as a very important thing because companies want to operate across multiple different public and private clouds at the same time. It should be possible to deploy and operate any standard application or component on any cloud in exactly the same way with exactly the same declarative descriptions. It should also be straightforward to integrate software deployed across diverse clouds and integrate cloud SaaS with the local applications. All of the above could be achieved by using Juju and Juju Charms, the declarative way of building the infrastructure and deploying the applications in a reliable and convenient manner. In this demo, we will use OpenStack as an underlying cloud for the Charm Kubernetes deployment. We will go through the several important topics regarding the Charm Kubernetes, including bootstrapping, integration with the underlying cloud, deploying a sample application with the load balancer, using the persistent volume claims backed by the OpenStack storage. For this demo, Ceph will be used as a storage and the multi-tenancy. Let's begin. For the purpose of this demo, we have already provisioned the small but fully operational OpenStack cluster using the same technology stack we were talking about before, Juju and its OpenStack charms. Here's how our underlying clouds look like. Here we could see OpenStack internals. Later on, we will be able to see the Kubernetes internals in exactly the same way. However, this cloud doesn't have any Kubernetes installed, so let's do it right now. In order to achieve this, we will need a so-called Kubernetes bundle. It could be acquired either from the Charm Kubernetes website or by issuing a Charm pool CLI command. Now, we have just downloaded a vanilla bundle, fully ready for the production-grade Kubernetes deployment. But before we start, let's take a look at the bundle itself, how is it built and what are the possibilities in terms of the bundle modification. In general, the bundle is a YAML file which describes the applications which are expected to be deployed and their relations between each other. This knowledge helps Juju to provision the machines, install appropriate software packages and configure them properly to ensure no manual actions will be needed to start the cluster operation. While this bundle is fully ready to be deployed, Let's make a small amendment and reduce the Kubernetes workers quantity to have an opportunity to try one of the most important day two operational aspects, a cluster scale up. Now we have a bundle to deploy, but first we'll have to bootstrap the Juju controller. It's very simple, just issue the bootstrap command and Juju will create a new VM instance and configure it to be a new cloud controller. Just to save us some time and avoid any unnecessary typos, we've prepared a short bootstrap script. Let's take a look on it. And the bootstrap has been finished and we now have a second Juju controller deployed on top of the OpenStack cloud. Great. We are all set to kick off the Kubernetes deployment. It's very simple as well. We need to issue a single command, Juju deploy bundle.yaml and that's pretty much it. Now, our cluster is deploying. However, in order to use the underlying cloud advantages such as load balancing, block storage and so on, we will also need to install the so-called integrator. Let's do this. While the integrator is being deployed, let's add some config options to ensure the integrator will have access to the underlying cloud. First, we'll need to provide the integrator with the cloud credentials. This is an essential thing since the integrator will be doing API calls to the underlying cloud endpoints in order to provision the requested resources, such as load balancers and so on. However, with Juju, we don't need to expose the credentials directly. Instead, we will tell Juju to provide these credentials in a secure way to the charm itself. Also, a relationship between the integrator and the Kubernetes charm has to be established. This is required in order to let both parties be aware of each other so they could exchange the data. Kubernetes would send a service provisioning request, while the integrator will provision the service by talking to the underlying cloud API and tell the Kates cluster about the provisioning status. The last step in the integrator configuration, we need to set some network-related defaults and permit the OpenStack integrator to manage the OpenStack security groups automatically, to ensure all of the firewall rules are being configured without any operator intervention.
That's all. The OpenStack integrator has been configured. We just need to wait until everything else will settle up. This should take some time, approximately around 15 minutes. Great. Now we have a fully working Kubernetes cluster, which is ready to serve your workloads. Before we start, we need to copy a kubeconfig file from the master. Awesome. But what if we need more compute capacity? Remember, we've asked Gigi to provision less workers. That's not an issue. That's it. We just need to wait for a couple of more minutes to let Juju do its magic. Of course, it could also be scaled down in exactly the same way by issuing the Juju remove unit command. And we are now ready to deploy the demo workload. It will be two Nginx pods in a Kubernetes, being exposed to the outside world by OpenStack's load balancer. Let's do it. Now we'll have to wait for a couple of more minutes to let everything be provisioned. All right, let's verify if it works or not. No, it doesn't. And that's fully expected because by default, all ingress traffic has been blocked by the OpenStack security groups. We will need to explicitly allow the traffic flow from the OpenStack load balancer to the pods. In order to do this, we will need to get the security group name, which has been provisioned automatically by Juju at the moment of the model deployment. This can be done by issuing an OpenStack CLI command querying its API by the instance ID, which is available in the Juju status output. All right, we have two security groups here, a cluster-wide one and another one for the fine-grained tuning of the security rules for the particular machines. Since we are enabling load balancing and we don't want to alter these rules every time we'll scale up our cluster, let's use a cluster-wide group. The remote AP range is defined by the OpenStack operator. This is a network being used for the VM provisioning and the port range is effectively the native Kubernetes node port range being used by the load balancer to reach out to the particular port. Let's check our source once again. And that's it. Now we have a deployed service inside the Kubernetes built on top of the OpenStack cloud and accessible over the exposed external IP by OpenStack's load balancing service. There is one more thing you'd probably like to be aware of. The OpenStack integrator charm has not only the load balancer, but the container storage interface integration, so the OpenStack's native block storage service, Cinder, can be used for the Kubernetes persistent volume claims. It's extremely easy to use this feature, since the storage class has already been created by the OpenStack integrator. We just need to reference it in the volume claim definition. Let's take a look at the pod spec. Let's wait until the pod and PVC will be provisioned. The pod is running. And as we can see, the persistent volume claim is there. Let's verify it on the center side. The volume is there as and it's in the in-use status. The last thing we'll talk about today is the OpenStack and Kubernetes multi-tenancy capabilities. Combining OpenStack isolation techniques and Kubernetes rapid deployment options, you might optimize your workflows to easily spawn a new fully isolated cluster whenever necessary and tear it down later to save compute resources in your cloud. There are two ways of achieving this goal. The first one is to use multiple GD models in the same controller, and the second one is to use another OpenStack project and bootstrap another controller inside the project. While in the end, either of the options will result in a deployed Kubernetes cluster with the only difference, the latter one will be provisioned in the separate OpenStack project. For the purpose of this demo, we will use the former option, as it's less time-consuming and doesn't require any additional preparations. Resources created by the same Juju controller are sharing the backend cloud and its resources. That means that the VMs of the boss clusters will exist inside the same OpenStack project and technically could be visible for the, each other in case of sharing the same internal networks. However, Juju has a bunch of model-related options, including the network selection ones. Let's create a new internal network inside the OpenStack and use it for the new cluster deployment.
As we already have the external network and the router from the previous deployments, let's attach this newly created network to the existing router. Now, let's create a new Juju model and tell it explicitly to use another internal network. Now, we can deploy another Kates cluster in exactly the same way like we did before. And we can see in real time how it's being provisioned. That's it for today. Hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something new. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.